This episode of the MVP cast is sponsored by the British Basketball All-Stars Championship. Find out more at allstarsbasketball.co.uk. Winterberg pulls up the three, boom, knocks it down. Curry from the corner at three, puts it in. For overtime, makes it go. Well, a warm welcome to episode three of the MVP cast from me, Mark Woods. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if this is your first listen, remember you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or find us on TuneIn Radio on all your smart devices for both. Just search for MVP cast. And if you want to find out more about how to support the show, head to MVP247.com and click on podcasts. My guest on this edition really needs no introduction, but let's give you one anyway. She is, in my opinion anyway, the Britain's greatest female player of this current generation, an Olympian, a champion abroad, and the catalyst behind much of GB's successes over the past decade, and probably the biggest thing to come out of Ellesmere Port, well, um, since the original Vauxhall van. Joe Leadham, welcome to the MVP cast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with this season. You've joined Polish champions Polkowice after five years, successful years over in France. What was the thinking behind the, the change of scene? Um, to be honest, um, it was just like a new opportunity, like something different. I think after leaving Bourges and going to a different French team, it was kind of more difficult than I expected and and I didn't have like a great season last year and then this was a new opportunity and somewhere else and I've always had a lot of people tell me I need to get outside of France so <laughs> I just thought I need to go now it's now or never you know so it was just kind of something like that. Women's basketball in, in, in France you and I've been there for big tournaments you know the club games that you've played and it, it's taken so seriously over there G- give me a flavor of just what that environment was like to be a female basketballer playing professionally there it's just it's just on another level because they they consider what we do i mean i consider what i do a real job like you know without sounding daft but like not everybody and you go to other countries it, it, you know like most people ask you oh you play professional basketball yeah but what else do you do like, well, you know, so many people ask my mom and dad, yeah, but what else does she do? Or, or does she have enough money to survive? And my dad's like, you know, it was like, what people don't realize is you're making more money than like people that are in the BBL, like, or probably more money than some of their budgets or something. I don't know. Not a lot of money in the BBL or like the WBBL, like whatever, but not to sound like, you know what I mean, but... <laughs> I don't know. It's just like another level. They treat you like it's your real job. You know, if you're hurt, you're fully covered and you can get back on your feet and recover and, and work again doing your job. They're just basketballs at the top of their list is one of their main sports and it really does compete with football. And you can just see that when you look at the national teams and how they're treated, the things that they're provided with in order to be successful and it's, it's just like being in another world when you're in France, especially when you compare it to somewhere like Great Britain, which is just like super sad because it's not like, you know, it's Great Britain. It's not like we're talking about a third world country. We're talking about United Kingdom. Having spent time in the French system, and it's not just basketball, it's across lots of different sports, but you see the club systems that they have and the facilities, etc. In Britain, what's the biggest thing we could learn from that? I just think it's like you said, um, when you invest in something, it's not something that necessarily grows and has immediate success overnight. It and and basketball, it's like a sport. It doesn't take like weeks either. It's something that takes months and years and you have to have time and patience. And I understand like it's it's a business as well and you know, people people wanna see growth and they wanna see success and money turnover and this, that and the other, but like you have you have to know the sport and to be able to point out and see like okay actually it is growing and there is success because if you don't really understand basketball then you you might not see the success but for the people that 
do now, they would see like the little triumphs, which are positive, which eventually will become bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the success will start coming, you know, and I think that's what they were able to like achieve in france they they're they're willing to put their their money into these clubs and these teams and and they found success doing it i mean you just look at where even just the french women because that's what i've had experience with like the where they're at in terms of as a basketball country they're like a powerhouse in their league this year might be the best it's ever been the strongest it's ever been from top to bottom so and it's just from investments and people you know trusting and having faith and knowing it's not going to grow overnight but it's it's going to be something that's worth it in the end they've brought a lot of those top players back to the the french league not all but but a good chunk mm-hmm. of them but obviously for you to come back would be as you said you'd be taking a massive drop in salary and is, is there a sense of sadness maybe that you'll not have that opportunity to go and play in your homeland and, and kind of i guess earn a proper crust for doing so absolutely like i you know i'm getting older now and you start to think about okay what am i going to do afterwards and my passion really is basketball you know a lot of people have other passions too but i feel like mine really is basketball and i feel like i i have like a gift with like a basketball brain i mean that's my opinion other people might say different <laughs> but i feel like i really understand the game and i really would love to give back to basketball in britain but i just don't see where i can do that and the fact that I can't play like in front of my family and stuff every day, like, yeah, it's or every week. It's yeah, it's really sad. And I mean, another sad um, part of that is also like living, living away from my husband. Like we don't have like as much as stability as I would like, you know, like I'm kind of being forced right now to live in America, which is in the summer, but it's, you know, I've spent most of my, the last eight years, like, in Europe for majority of like each year and I don't know like how I feel like if I'll be okay with like you know living in America permanently and stuff like that but I don't know what job opportunities like I can really do like over here especially basketball in Britain like there's just like you said going back to the investment there's no investment in it at the end of the day like we all need jobs we need to make money you know and there's no money in basketball right now. When you were growing up and you're playing you know, sort of a junior level in, in Ellesmere Port, what, what was the point when you thought, I, I quite fancy the idea of making some kind of career out of this? I don't, a lot of people ask me that and I don't really, I might like give a different answer to every question <laughs> because I can't really remember because it was, it was kind of just someone had like suggested to us, you know, that we were pretty good at basketball. We should probably go to America. And my parents were kind of just like, oh, yeah, whatever. And then it kind of came like a reality. And we like went and we really did it. And then I think it must have been like when I was in college and it like came to, you know, picking studies. What do you want to study this, that and the other and my mum would always say to me, you know, basketball is not for life. You need to you need to make sure you have your education, this, that and the other. But now at the point I'm at in my life, I'm like, basketball really has become my life. Like, yeah, I have another life too, but like I've given so much to basketball. I'm like, oh, I don't know like what what else I would like really do without it. But I don't know. So I guess when I was like maybe in my freshman year of college, that's when I really thought like, and my mom would tell you this, like, I would always say, no, I'm going to play basketball. I want to play basketball professionally. I'm going to play basketball. Like, she would always tell me, you know, you need to do something else. But I would always tell her, like, I was adamant I was going to play, like, basketball professionally. But I didn't realize, like, the scale of I wasn't keeping up with your league or I had no idea what any of that kind of stuff <laughs> was, you know. It was only, like, when my dad started, like, researching it and when I actually, like, first contract was a EuroLeague team. I was like, wow. And then I was like playing with um, Yelena Luchenka and it was kind of like, oh my gosh, like this is huge. <laughs> I mean, you had the, the slight advantage that you were following your, your elder sister, Jen, kind of through the system and you were at the same college and coming through, how much of a help was that? Or, or I guess there must've been some sort of sibling rivalry. What, what was that partnership, I guess, like for you to? Yeah, I think it, it was definitely probably easier because it's 
it had to be like more daunting for Jen being like the oldest. And I mean, even though like we went and did everything together, so we kind of always, it wasn't like someone went and, you know, did it and then the other one just followed in the footsteps. I mean, I guess going to college, that kind of process, yeah. But going across to the States, you went together. But I guess having someone to do it with makes it like less daunting. It's like, you know, you hold each other's hand, like going through the process. I mean, for sure for Jen, like she was the first one to go to college and stuff like that. So that had to be done in. Then I ended up going to the same college. So it kind of was like everything was made like a little bit easier for me, I guess, because I always had the comfort of knowing that my sister was there, you know, and I would always have someone like no matter what. And everybody else doesn't really have that, you know, so that has definitely made everything easier. And I don't know, growing up, we were always, like, there was always sibling rivalry, like, even, like, with Kirsty, like, we were just always just battering each other, like, and my dad was, like, you know, he had, like, no mercy for any of us, and I remember we always joke now about how we used to go on holiday camping in Cornwall for, like, six weeks in the summer, and it was, like, my dad made us join a swimming club, and we'd have to, like, go swimming and stuff like that, and he'd like make us run around the common like and he would like make me and Jen like race each other like not want me to like beat Jen and stuff like that and he would like push it you know so yeah it was we always like joke about it now how it was like a crazy like holiday where it wasn't like you just go on holiday and chill out it was like we were getting up and being like made to run but that's (laughs) like what makes you who you are you know what I mean I mean, Jen left college and, and kind of went into the coaching ranks and was head coach at Franklin Pierce, is now an assistant at Wagner University. I mean, is that a path you see yourself following as well when you finally finish playing? I just, it's like, it's one of them where I'm like, it's you can do right now because like what what I do, like I, I'm really lucky in what I do, but I also think it's very difficult in that people don't know how much time you spend by yourself and uh, how much time you spend away from your family and and that's a really difficult part of it and when I speak to Jen like she what she does it's it's almost like the same thing although she's doing it in America and she does you know have stability in that she like has her home and things like that but the hours she works are like ridiculous like and I'm like I don't know if I could go and do pretty much what I'm doing now but not even be playing be like and traveling everywhere and you know early mornings late nights like it just seems like I'm not sure if I could like do that it's it's like a proper job yeah so I'm like oh god like I don't know maybe I'd, I'd be better off going to get another proper job like it's just <laughs> nine to five you know and then I can legit leave and like go to happy hour with my husband or something could you ever see yourself in an office job but that's that's a tough one for an athlete yeah I don't know I mean probably not like <laughs> yeah I don't think I could do it you've over your career I mean one of the things that you've had to to manage in addition to playing is, is injuries and you've spoken a lot about the sort of the, the tricky balance that there's had to be between you know playing at your best and also making sure you can last a season and sometimes you've sat out international games or sometimes you've limited practices I mean, so tell me a little bit about that sort of process and regime you've developed for sort of self-care. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's only really since the last, this summer was like the first time where I really, I mean, last summer I like really started to like focus and make changes, but this summer too was like more of a wake-up call just because last year, you know, and, and I had injuries and and. I'm not like a person that hides anything like and to be honest like my agent part of like the things was um the feedback my agent was getting was that we we love the we love the player we absolutely love the player Jolene but we're just concerned that she has like a lot of injuries which nobody wants to really hear that you know but it's like it's it's fact it is what it is but like also like what people don't understand is that like I'm a person that's I've literally done all of my career like a hundred percent I've been a hundred percent in practice and then a hundred percent two games a week like and then all the travel on top of that and you know people love you at the time when you're the the hardest one in practice pushing the limit you know and all this kind of stuff but as soon as you get injured then you're kind of like 
oh, you're always injured, you're injury prone, this, that, and the other. You're no longer like this great person to have on your team that just goes so hard all the time. And so it's kind of been a process of learning that I have to put myself first and not the teams and that remembering that like this is a business and I I'm the I'm the product and I have to look after myself like and not think with my heart and be like yeah I'm part of this team and put my heart and soul into it and think like more with my head and be like no I'm the business product and yeah this is a team so you have to put your heart into it a little bit because like I wouldn't be myself if I didn't do that but you also have to realize that you're pretty much useless if you're not like a hundred percent so it's been kind of like trying to find a balance of like staying true to myself but like being more selfish at the same time if that makes sense and then little things like um tweaking off season like workouts what I'm doing and then like what I'm eating and things like that trying different things out like with food what works what doesn't work like just been a whole process but I mean I'll never forget like was Celine Demerck I don't know what year it was when I was at Borge second or third and she like told me one day like you you just can't practice like this all the time like it's not possible (laughs) like it's not good for you you know what I mean and like they would always make fun of me because I was like 100% all the time even when we were like winning by 30 or something like I'd be like in the lanes denying passes and they would like she I remember she told me she was like you need to be cool like you gotta look after yourself this that and the other and I just you know in my head I was like oh these French people they just don't know how to work hard this that and the other but now (laughs) all these years later I'm like I get it like she knew because she was older she had more experience of like how hard it is what we do on our bodies and you know we don't have like regular shooting in the week we're practicing still like hardcore like it's very demanding like on your body plus two games a week with the travel it's not like private jet travel you know it's like hardcore travel too and you're expected to perform so it's like yeah you you just can't be 100 percent all the time and that's okay there's nothing wrong with that i mean you mentioned diet what's the biggest thing that you have changed uh, and say that again in my diet yes um they i i would say this year i've like become more focused of like being aware of like i know it's it sounds like daft because you think you would be you would figure this out like a long time ago but you you take for granted i think when you're in a sport like basketball that you're not like boxing or gymnastics or something where you know weight is a big factor or you know just little things like that but it's like being aware of what works like put eating this before a game isn't going to work for me or you know having a coffee here isn't great I need to have like switch it and have a green tea instead and okay maybe like like now I, I like haven't eaten meat for about five weeks or something like that and I've like actually like felt pretty good and had like knock on wood like least amount of niggles that I've had so I'm kind of like secretly devastated because we're telling my teammates <laughs> so I was like I really want to eat meat but I feel like pretty good at the moment so I just don't want to break the cycle because I'm just too afraid that I don't know if that's what's working or if it's not what working so I'm like just going with what I'm doing right now because I feel like pretty good so Poland is not Poland's that. not the ideal country to go meat free though I know, I know. But there's actually like more, I thought it would be really hard, but there's more more people that um, are meat free than I actually thought. And the team's pretty good. Like they always like provide you like with, they ask you if you have dietary needs and stuff and they will always provide like good food. So it's been good so far. Let's just pause for a minute to tell you all about the British Basketball All-Stars Championship, which returns on Sunday, October the 14th at the Copper Box Arena in London. Eight of the BBL's best teams doing battle in this electrifying tournament, which will be live on Sky Sports. It features 12-minute games, an all-star five-point line, and a golden buzzer power play. All of which will make the British Basketball All-Stars Championship a fun-filled afternoon of fast-paced basketball action, which of course is returning in 2018 after its successful debut last year. The tournament will again showcase the best of British basketball talent with defending champions London Lions amongst the top eight teams from last season's BBL in action. No excuse for you not to be there. Tickets are now on sale 
at allstarsbasketball.co.uk. My guest in this edition is Joe Leedham. I suppose to give you your full name now, Joe Leedham Warner, because you, as you mentioned, you got married last year. Your husband's back in the States. And I just wonder, given how long you've played and sort of you talked about family, does it feel like more of a sacrifice now to be overseas, despite the fact that it's it's a great job? But as you said, it's not kind of like a job and you pay, get paid well for it. But does it feel like you have to give up more now to keep this career? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's honest. Honestly, it's like it's awful. I know awful sounds like like it would be very traumatic, but like <laughs> without being like dramatic, but like it's so hard. Like, and it's as if when we got married, it got even harder. Like when I left last year, I don't know if it's because it was my first year, like at a new team as well, and I like left Borge, which was the place I was very comfortable in. I had friends, like I had a home life there too, kind of. So I don't know if it was that as well, but leaving again this year, it's it's just, it's awful. Like, I can't even think of another word to describe it. Like, without sounding like a baby, like, you know, you literally cry the whole way to the airport. Then you, like, get yourself together because you don't want to be that person crying at the airport. And then, but you just, like, you just can't help it. I don't know. It, it's just awful. You just feel like something's always missing. And then, like, having two days off and something you don't you know you have your teammates and stuff but it's I don't know it's weird when you go seeing someone and coming home to someone every day and then they're just not there and then you're like oh I've got to wait this amount of time to see them it's like I don't know something's like always missing it's just it's so hard and then like just always talking on the phone FaceTime whatever it just gets so repetitive and it's like the hardest thing now that's the only thing that I'm like questioning is like, okay, it's if my body can hold up as well, because you just never can take your health for granted. But I'm like, I don't know if emotionally it's starting to take a toll on me, you know? So I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like I could end up finishing my career not, and my body could actually be okay, but it could be because I can't like emotionally handle it anymore. Because I don't know, this this time was really hard as well. And I'm just like, oh, I just don't know how long I can see myself <laughs> to keep doing this it's too hard how much does that require him to be incredibly supportive and encouraging of your choice to do this yeah I mean you have to have a partner that's like supportive and like selfless and because you know when you speak to people and they figure out that you guys aren't together like that often it's people think you're like absolutely mad or like crazy but it's, <laughs> it's become like our normal but it's because like you know he's supportive and he's selfless and and it you know we're, we're only like humans like he wasn't always like that but he he come to learn and you know my mom kind of like told him like look I don't ask you to do anything but just let her finish her career like on her terms like don't push her don't force her because if you do you know it'll just it'll just be a big mess for your marriage or whatever like down the line and to be fair he's he's like the most supportive person ever like along with obviously my parents but you know to to let me go and obviously I'm working but to do it like all the way over here and you know a lot of men wouldn't be okay with that if it was the other way around you know like a lot of men go and you know do that but it's not people just don't think women should be doing that you know and everyone has their opinions but yeah he's he's very supportive and yeah and what you wouldn't be able to do what we do if he wasn't like the way he is he's a very like chilled out person too so that's like lucky <laughs> i mean you did have a brief spell back in the states professionally when you had the the preseason stint with the the WNBA's connecticut sun and you mentioned you know some players playing overseas i mean some european players have enjoyed that league other people like celine dumer who you mentioned were probably a little bit less enthused about it what was your experience just in that short spell there i mean i like i think that anyone that gets to experience wmba should definitely do it i definitely felt like I went and I'm not the kind of person that would like blow my own trumpet and I feel like I'm pretty honest but I definitely felt like I, I was robbed and it was more kind of like my face didn't really fit or it was kind of like 
no one was going to be sad if they cut this little white girl from Elvemere Port <laughs> in England that nobody even knew where it was. But if they cut this girl from Yukon, Kelly Ferris, like people were going to be in uproar, especially because we were in Connecticut. I mean, I had the the late Ann Donovan who coached me who mm-hmm. uh, not long ago passed away. But I remember she said to me, like, I wish I had 11 players like you. And I remember just like thinking, in my, I was, I just walked away like completely like, you know, no emotions because it was like, there's literally nothing else I could have done to make the team with the coaches telling you they wish they had 11 players like you and they didn't even pick you. Like it just speaks for itself, you know, but I think everything's meant to happen for a reason. Then with all the injuries that then came for me, like playing in the summer is not something that's probably necessarily like good for me. And, you know, you see all the travel they do and you could probably ask Kemi about that. You know, it's so tiring. Like, so I, I think that everyone, should, if you get that opportunity, you should definitely try it because it's the WNBA. Like, who doesn't want to be a part of that, you know? But, yeah, I'm more like with Celine, I think, where it's like, meh, you, you can risk a big contract just to say you played, you know, WNBA. You see, like, some players that have got, you know, even Angel McCoffrey or Jameera Faulkner, who are Americans, but have your, um, well, Jameera Faulkner has European passport. She's, like, tore at ACL, and I think she was going to ECAT. So she probably just lost, like, a ton of money, you know, doing that. So I don't know. It's it's one of them where each to their own kind of thing. But I would never, like, turn my nose down to it or say no like you shouldn't try it because come on it's WNBA. I mean I guess we all kind of took notice of it more last year because of what Tammy Five Benley did and winning the championship at Minnesota and it's great you guys are going to play together again this year in, in a club level at Poco Beach I mean have you maybe watched that did it ever make you think I'd love to give that one shot before I finish this career? Yeah, and it's funny you say that because I went, actually went when I met my agent this summer. We usually meet like at a WNBA, WNBA game, and we went um, and we went and we met one. And I did say to him, I said, "Oh, every time I watch come and watch WNBA, I always just think I just wish I would have like made the roster, or I would have loved to do this." And he's like, "You know, like you." You never, you never know like what's going to happen. But at this point, I'm definitely more focused on my career in Europe because that's where you make the money. But um, I don't know. I definitely wouldn't say I've closed the the book on that completely yet. But my health is definitely a priority. But yeah, I mean, I I would love to. I'd be lying if I said, you know, no, I don't want to. I don't want to go. Or no, I would. But it's like, it's like the only thing I haven't really checked off my list completely. Mm-hmm. I know I went to camp and stuff like that, but it's not the same as making the roster. We see this week with the FIBA World Cup starting in, in Tenerife. And I think, I don't know what it's like over in Poland, but here, pretty invisible as, a, as an event. And if you were running this sport, you had a role maybe in FIBA, how do you think you would want to improve the kind of status of women's hoops that people would be paying attention to the, to the World Championship of basketball? I mean, it's just... It's so hard because you just comparing men and women. It's it's just we're so different, like as specimens alone. Never mind, like as athletes. Do you know what I mean? So so the 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 men in the women's game are just so different anyway. But I think that they've just got to be like the platform that social media provides. You've got to be all over it. Like I mean, like your thumbs are like never stopping. Do you know? What? Like you've just got to be all over social media plastering it everywhere because that's where everybody is everyone's looking there I don't know I just think and that people are on social media but I think they've just got to be more crazy about it because that's the own people are looking at that all the time but I don't know it's one of them where it's like what is the answer because it, it is like really hard and it's like everyone's wondering like what do we have to do you know to promote ourselves but no one's like seemed to have the answer yeah it's I don't know it's just kind of hard you know because people say you know the women's game is not as exciting as the men's it's that and the other and so it's like hard but I don't know I do think that you have to really appreciate the game of basketball to appreciate women's basketball 
Do you think I mean, do when, like... when you talked about you know, salaries and obviously at the level you're playing at comparatively, it's at the higher end of women's basketball, but then you then look at what the men's get paid and I guess we have this pay debate going on everywhere at the moment, but do you sort of, yeah. is there a sense that you feel grateful for what you get or a sense that you feel frustrated that you don't get what the men get for paying the same job? Um, I, to be honest, I haven't like ever really sat down and thought about it because like, or like put a great deal of thought into it because I'm just so grateful to, to do what I do and I just know there's like worse things in in life that can be going on you know what I mean but I mean I'm I'm all for like equality and this that and the other and how in America they have title nine so Mm -hmm. women to have the same like opportunities and quality as men but it's it's so hard because it's like a lot of the money comes from like viewing and how like the popularity and things like that and I don't know it's like one of them where you you don't want to say the wrong thing as a woman but like you, you know you I mean even I don't know I could be wrong like let's it'll be interesting to see like now the men's and the women's GB teams are both playing in Manchester how many come for the women's and how many come for the men's you know it'll actually be interesting to see it just seems like people are more they just gravitate more to men's sport than women and that's like a big thing of why they do get more money because people want to endorse it more because they think it's more exciting and and then they just have more money you know I mean not even outside of basketball you look at the national football teams like the women's football team is so good they've like in like previous previous years they've had more success than the men you know it was only really this year where the men kind of really actually did something um but no one ever talks about the um england women's football team like ever i don't know what their pay gap is or anything like that but i'm pretty sure that's not the same and it's just one of them things where it's like being a woman isn't it like it's just another thing that you have to deal with but i'm just kind of more like like you said like I'm grateful to be able to do what I do at the moment and I'm like grateful that you know I'm aware that I'm able to make good money for my family and stuff like that but if I guess if I really thought about it in the pay gap then maybe it would be like a bigger problem for me. Last couple of things we'll let you out of here on these World Cup can anyone beat the USA is everyone playing for second who's playing for second? Yeah I agree with you. I think it's more of like who's playing for the second. Although I I have watched like the US like, and they just they don't look as great as they've looked in previous years. And they've taken a couple of players that like are like average for me. I don't know if it's because other people weren't available or whatever. Um, but I think then other other te- like Australia are missing some key players like Mariana Tolo, like who's coming up at ACL. She's like huge for them. Like she's a huge loss. So I don't know like if other teams really have like the depth and the strength to even go with the US. And then, you know, you, you're always kind of back France a little bit because, but then you're always like, well, they kind of always underachieve or or they just you know I read an article that maybe Paul had done like not that long ago that was like they're just they just never like achieve what they should achieve they're just kind of like they're there but they don't go to the I don't know you always expect so much more of them and they never actually do it so I don't know so I, I've watched like games and teams have looked good and then the next day they didn't look so good so second place I'd have to go with like Australia for now because they've only seem like like pretty dominant but then again they played like um Argentina was their last game I think and then Nigeria although Nigeria like on a bad team so I'd probably I don't know I'd probably go with Australia just simply because Liz is just dominating Cambridge and no one seems to be able to stop her she was an absolute beast if, if everyone saw her at the Commonwealth Games and of course that, that final against England where she got thrown out in the early in the second quarter, late in the first quarter and it didn't really make much of a difference which I think spoke, speaks a lot about the depth of the Aussies. Last two things, quick for once. Who's the toughest opponent you've ever had and who's been your favourite player to play with? 
Oh, they're like really good questions. <laughs> Ones where you're like, you need to kind of think about them. <laughs> so I saved them to last. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're really good questions. Um, I mean, when you think of like toughest opponents, like as teams, without saying like the obvious of, you know, when you played, when we played USA for GB, they were probably the toughest because it's like just an all star cast. But then when I think about like my Euroleague career, it would it would have to be like either Ekaterinburg or Kursk, just because just the the amount of players that they have and it's as if like sometimes like you know when you start a game and then you know, you start to get into the rotation and you think, All right, like this this one's not as powerful as this one, so sure she's just a shooter so that's going to be like a little bit easier to guard on defense but like when you play Ekaterin Berg and Kursk it's like they just keep rotating in in like all stars like oh no like Angel McCoftry's out like in comes Petrovic or whatever you know it's like you just never get a break when you play those teams so it probably like those teams would be like the toughest um and favorite player I've ever played with. I mean, Jen was like pretty awesome to play with because she just <laughs> knew me like the back of my, like she just knew everything that I was going to do before I actually do it. And I definitely wouldn't have had the college career that I had without her. Like, you know, a lot of people look at my career and think it's awesome. And, and it like it is, but like, you know, scoring 3000 points and stuff like that. I just don't know if like I would have done that without her being in there. And no one ever really talks about that, you know. Like I just, I just don't know if like I would, I would have done that without her. But then, I guess like professional career favorite player to play with, probably. I mean, I played with so many good players. It's hard to just like choose. <laughs> I'm guessing the lead in Mark must be right up there because yeah. you guys always seem to enjoy playing together. Yeah, like she she's the first one that comes to mind because yeah, it, it it was we just grew like such a good partnership like on the court and yeah, it's just so fun playing with her and she ended up like really learning like how I play and so you know that I was a risk taker and when I took risks she would always like cover my back and stuff like that. So I really like enjoyed playing with her. I mean, this this year is going to be my first year playing with Tammy professionally, so I'm like, I, like really excited about that. I don't know if like two British people have ever played, like even played in the Euroleague at the same time together. Or me and Tammy would have last year, but to be on the same Euroleague team, that has to be a first, maybe. Well, I think it's a partnership a lot of hoops geeks in this country are going to really enjoy watching this year. Really looking forward to seeing it. Joe, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time and the very best of luck for the, the forthcoming season. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So that is it for this episode of the MVP cast. If you want to get in touch, head to MVP Magazine's Facebook page or Instagram or hit me up on Twitter at Mark Britt Bull. You can still listen, of course, to our recent conversations with Kieran Achara and Rob Paternostro. Lots more great guests lined up over the next few weeks. A big thanks to our sponsors, the British Basketball All-Stars Championship. And if you find us on iTunes, please do leave a rating and a review, preferably a nice one. But for me, Mark Woods, it's goodbye. <laughs>